Um, uh, welcome uh, to all in this cafe. I think if it's already clear to everybody that we are in a cafe, which means that uh, Janis and I are your um, host tonight. We are the bartenders, so we hope to keep you in order, but as well to uh, keep you stimulating to have an um, inspiring talk all together. Uh, it's a very intimate cafe today, but um, um, it, um, it will make the conversation even more um, the, the, the more interesting uh, to be able to talk in a smaller group. So um, you uh, the, were all invited um, to talk about the work you have conceived, you have proposed, you have created uh, in, um, in the framework of the walking as a question, walking and encounters and confidence in uh, PLESPA, about which Janis will tell you in a minute a bit more. And um, which started, of course, as the title says, from a question and um, uh, wanted to invite people to listen to you while walking and um, interacting with the environment uh, through an audio paper or an audio walk. Uh, the audio paper is a format that was proposed some years ago uh, and comes out of the so-called performative philosophy um, uh, discipline, which invites uh, people to think not only with their mind, but with their whole body, and not only to think um, isolated from the world, but to think and to interact with the world as a form of thinking. And um, uh, for PLESPA, specifically in these very difficult circumstances uh, where many of you wanted to be there but could not come, and um, others uh, didn't have the possibility to come, uh, for other reasons, uh, we were looking for a format to walk together uh, with you and uh, people in PLESPA uh, to walk with um, the ones that were not able to come through a contribution, a text, uh, an audio that invited uh, to walk and to think together and to um, ask and to try answer questions together. So um, the, form of an, uh, the format of an audio paper had three um, elements, uh, which is uh, the text, the walk, and um, uh, the listening. Um, so uh, before that, I will give you the uh, possibility to introduce yourselves, uh, which I will leave to you, uh, the, um, and to tell something more about your approach uh, to the walking as a question. Um, um, in uh, PRESPA. Um, I will uh, ask Janis maybe to tell something very briefly about uh, uh, what happened in PRESPA and uh, the background of it. Janis? Yes, uh, thank you, Gert. Uh, I welcome you also to this cafe. And uh, uh, cafe is one thing that is uh, was against the salon of the big bourgeois, you know, who and they're very wealthy. So it was the middle class uh, revenge of being able, being allowed to discuss and talk somewhere in a, a non, uh, in an open environment because the cafe was also open. Anyone could come and join. Anyway. Uh, and in a way, not in a way, because in a way, this is what we want to create in PRESPA, to create an open forum when uh, we will create as many venues as possible to allow people to come and join us. And more important, by, by also by being there, which by itself is uh, in many cases and in uh, the situation that we are now, in a way, I would not call it an achievement, but it is something difficult. It, it is, I, I would say, a contribution that we all put in that effort, so to say. So by being, uh, we will, uh, and also what we have said many times, maybe I will repeat myself, creating a place of return, meaning a place where either virtually, like we do now, or literally by being there, we exchange ideas, we talk, we discuss, but not only in that place, uh, but also in places like Sardinia, like Chile, like uh, Scotland, where people met and uh, worked on similar venues. 
So I welcome you again in that uh, framework, so to say, and we will uh, make every possible effort to keep that going. Thank you very much. Maria Vistani, can I ask you to introduce you and to say something about uh, your work? No? Sure, Gerrit, thank you. Um, so, and thank you both, Yanis and Gerrit, for um, today's event and also for the PRESPA event. Um, um, I'm Maria Vistani, as you can read. Um, under my picture, um, I teach at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki in Greece. Um, I teach performance art um, and also research methodology. I've worked on the relation of uh, theatre and music for some years, so I'm interested in um, theatre experiments that uh, draw on, on sound and music and listening. Um, now, participating in the PRESPA event, I, I worked on, on the topic of headphone listening, that bubble-like private experience, and the way this interacts with physical walking in space. And I've looked at the ways in which um, uh, theatre sound walks draw on the seeming opposition and creatively rewrite that seeming opposition. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a paper of cerebral making of intellectual reasoning and critical discussion and proper, in quotation marks, scholarship, um, or at least this would have been a paper of merely intellectual reasoning and analytical discussion and proper scholarship if it weren't delivered in the audio paper format. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm very, very grateful for the experience of working on an audio paper because it got me reminded of what um, Holger Sulze describes as the less noble research practices, like kinesthetic sensing, like walking, dancing, eating, smelling, tasting, listening, um, those that often get neglected, not as, as accepted in the academia, um, considered less, less reliable compared to more research practices like reading, like counting, like interpreting a visual or a verbal text. Um, so this, this opportunity to work on an audio paper gave me, gave me the chance to rethink academic writing. Um, so when I, I, I scribbled down my, my words and my thoughts before the recording stage, I, I came to think about scholarly writing and um, this distinction between academic writing on the one hand and creative writing on the other stopped making sense. Um, and I got to discover that academic writing can be food for thought, of course, but also food for the body. Um, it, it is a mental exercise, of course, but it's also an active listening exercise. Um, listening to your inner voice, your thoughts as they become words, and then listening to the soundings of the words and to the voicings of the words, and then inviting with you. Um, I, I, I was also very much intrigued by the performative potential for academic writing. I was very much intrigued by um, the ways in which the body of my voice, that material body, that, that technologically mediated body as well, because it was recorded, that body that felt intimate, but at the same time alien, um, the ways in which it marked its presence in between my linear critical argumentation, um, the way that, that the voice worked, um, uttering, breathing, 
relishing some words, skipping others, decelerating, accelerating, and how it all the text transformed into an encounter, really, an encounter between the body of the voice and the sensing, moving body of the listener who would be listening to this to this food for for um, body and mind. Um, a very last comment is that I was also very much intrigued by the meta reflexivity of of the audio paper. So to speak about headphone listening and walking, to critically discuss headphone listening and walking, and to have people listen to you via headphones and walking at the same time, um, it sort of affected the way language worked. In a sense, language was no longer representational of the topic discussed, but in a sense, it was presenting, um, it was staging the experience as such. Um, so to sort of um, round things off, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for the experience afforded. I have to say that this was my first venture in um, audio papers. I've been trained in different uh, scholarly discourse methods. So I'm very grateful that I've discovered this and the potential um, that exists in audio writing, both for for um, the academia and also for the arts. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the experience and for all the learnings I received from that. I think that's all. And thank you, Maria, for this uh, journey and your uh, uh, thoughts. And um, the, if you feel uh, like uh, giving some feedback, some comment to Maria or to the others, uh, please use the chat. Um, you can, um, um, we will go to your questions and uh, um, your feedback uh, after, uh, after the talk. Um, or you can ask your questions directly, of course, uh, if you would like to. But you can also use the chat if you have some ideas or thoughts coming up, bubbling up uh, in the stream of mm -hmm. thoughts and ideas that will, you will hear. Um, and um, I would like to, to invite uh, Maria Sideri uh, to tell us something more about uh, uh, herself and her work she did for uh, Presma. Maria, can you tell us something more? Yes, hello everyone, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation, Gert and Yanis. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I had the chance to be in uh, the conference in the International Encounters in Prespa in July, which was a truly fantastic experience for me, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, because I'm currently doing my PhD in the University of Western Macedonia in Florida, and it was a very interesting way to meet a lot of uh, different people from my university uh, while attending workshops and uh, lectures. And also because um, the paternal, uh, my paternal grand grandparents come from the region of Prespa. So it was a way for me to reconnect somehow to my family's uh, histories in that region. Um, for the... Um, the actual medium of the audio paper. I was very excited when I saw the call because it's the first time that I have encountered that. Uh, and I, I am an artist working with performance sound and uh, voice, but uh, also I'm currently doing my uh, my PhD in, in Florida. Um, and it was a very interesting way to combine, as Maria has said, my artistic and my academic somehow um, experience. Uh, so it allowed me to be very creative during the process of recording and researching, but also in the actual act of presenting the paper. Um, uh, because what happened is that we were in this room in the conference that was divided in two parts and the, the audio speakers were mainly on the second part of the room. So I wanted to play uh, one extract of the audio recording and I thought that the people who are sitting in front are not going to be able to listen so well. So mm -hmm. I had some time, luckily, before my presentation because it was just after the break. So I started testing a little bit of how to engage with the audio piece uh, in a live way. So it turned out to
to be more like um, a performance lecture actually than presenting an audio paper and reading it or like um, in this kind of sometimes um, okay maybe not always but sometimes it can be a very boring and kind of conservative way of uh, engaging as well as a spectator with it so um, so I added uh, I did some tests and then I added I started like underlying words of the text and repeating them and then I started adding like gestures and um, I really felt that there was a very different uh, um, connection somehow with, uh, with the audience uh, while doing that because I felt more that I was performing um, the, the, the work than presenting it in, in a kind of linear way as Maria has said. So that was for the medium and then as far as it concerns the work itself, um, I, I don't use walking in my practice. That was also my first kind of encounter with walking. But I work, um, I'm a passionate of archives and my PhD research as well is uh, based on, um, uh, on performative archives and how the body acts as an, as an archive and an archivist itself. Um, so um, the research was for me extremely enriching because I sat down with my father and we went through uh, all the history of my my uh, my family's ancestors. So basically, my great grandfather manuscripts and uh, a, a lot of photographs. And then I have chosen um, some parts, so some objects. Uh, let's call them like that that uh, based on the methodology of mnemotechnics uh, that the ancient orators uh, used in order to uh, remember big amount of texts. And um, I have created this sort of like visual walk through my family's archive by um, um, uh, making reference to different uh, objects. Um, an important element was also that um, um, that this physicality of, of the walking for me is, um, is somehow I was inviting uh, myself to perceive the act of remembering as a physical act, like really as a walking, uh, as a walking uh, process. And I have found out a lot of stories about my family that I didn't know, uh, which was also very interesting, but also sometimes a little bit I don't know, uh, scary or dramatic or disappointing or um, 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 like one part, for example, was that uh, the, the stories, the traces of, my, of the women from the family uh, were very little. So uh, suddenly I felt also the need to uh, bring them into this walk by reciting their names, which was very emotional as well for me and I think for a lot of people in the audience. Um, and I think that's it. I mean, the, the, the piece itself now on the, on the website, there is an audio track with some selected images from, the, from my family's archive. Um, and um, I would like to record it again, um, somehow to add uh, from what I did in the conference. So for me also, it's a way of expanding somehow uh, the work and the liveness of it added to, to the experience of the audio paper itself. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's enough okay. for now. It's a lot of information. <laughs> To, to starting this uh, this work with us, uh, which we will continue uh, after we have listened to to everybody. Um, it's an, um, an, a very beautiful and, and um, uh, moving approach. Uh, in, uh, what you have uh, elaborated in, in your work, uh, as the people may have heard, uh, because uh, like Maria uh, said already, the um, all the works are on. Workless and Create on as well on the in the description of this night's event, so you can revisit them and re-listen them uh, if you wouldn't have done that uh, already. Um, talking about physicality and, and uh, the, the Prespa is a place of extreme walking, uh, as many of you may have um, um, experienced extreme walking in the sense of physical difficulty because it's a very rough 
wild uh, um, environment uh, where you as a human being are more than a guest than uh, uh, a dominant uh, uh, species. And um, it's as well a place of very strong um, scars and, and, and a very rough history. Um, so um, um, yeah, actually to, to, to go to this, to this let's say this physical memory or this physicality of, of walking. Um, I would like to invite uh, Simon to talk, talk a bit about his approach. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm the masochist in the room. Um, <laughs> that's walking. No, mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I mean, I've always been interested in, in walking from childhood, but it was only really as, um, I think when I was uh, an undergraduate that I really discovered uh, the story of, of a grandfather who I never met because my father had changed his name, which was understandable, um, it, 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 you know, when he did it. But my grandfather was a Polish a man who escaped and walked all the way through Europe uh, on foot. Um, all the way across the Beirut and then uh, finally across to Britain, a long, long journey. And I've only really ever understood that journey in uh, little, little bits and pieces of stories from other people. But that led me into some, into probably well over a decade of work, making theatre, making installations, um, performances, performance art, uh, some of which was taking audiences at night over mountains. And I also re started to think, and this led into my PhD, very much about the impact of a journey from one landscape to another, a forced journey really, as people flee, which of course is, is very current, uh, and what that does to belonging and identity. So. That really was the, the crux of a PhD that I did um, well over a decade ago now. And um, latterly, I think after I'd kind of worked on that and created all sorts of different um, pieces of work, I sort of arrived at this question of why people endure walking when it isn't forced, when it isn't a question of survival, but when it's uh, actually just something they choose to do. And I was very kind of uh, interested in everything from the ultra runner, you know, people who run um, 100 kilometers, you know, in one, and more than this, or, or people who um, even cycle a thousand miles. But particularly also that led me to pilgrimage. Sorry, my dog is, is, is crying to get into the next room. So if you can hear that, it's, it's my dog. Um, and maybe she'll come and sit with me and that'll be better. So um, this also naturally led me then to pilgrimage because pilgrimage, of course, is, um, I, I think a lot of the differences in the world, obviously, uh, it, we might say are, are religious differences. And that, of course, is uh, part of the one of the reasons why people are kind of forced to walk anyway. But one of the things that those religions have in common is the pilgrimage. And uh, the pilgrimage, I think, is absolutely an incredible experience, clearly. Uh, many pilgrimages in the world, uh, you know, are more than a thousand years old. So, for example, the one that we all know of in Europe, of course, is the Camino de Santiago. It's only one. I mean, there are many, many pilgrimages in, in Europe. So I became very interested in this idea of pilgrimage and started to write academically about it. Um, and I was also interested in the, the body as what's going on between the mind and the body in this process. So what is the efficacy? What is the use of, of uh, an endured walk? I realized also that more and more secular people are using walking in this way. So I started, I suppose, to create an argument that sort of... Um, suggested that the root uh, was as important, if not more important, than the venue, than the, the, the destination, because the root was very much the kind of process um, that was going on within the person. So the invitation to do the audio paper, and I totally agree with uh, Maria and Maria on this, because the invitation to do an audio paper actually sort of forces you away in a sense from some of the complexities of academic writing 
and towards, uh, if you'll forgive me, a normality of experience, because everybody walks, right, you know, um, and to a certain extent, that's a very, excuse the pun, it's a very grounded experience. It's an experience that, it, that needs to be explained, I think, and expressed um, in, in a way that suits the experience, and an audio paper was a beautiful way to do that. I discovered when I was recording it that all of my intentions in the abstract um, were, uh, what's the word, invaded by the conversations I just naturally had with people I met en route. Um, so all of these philosophical discussions I thought I would have with my friend who's a priest, I, I'm, I walked, I'm not a, a Christian. So it was, I mean, I thought we were going to have this very deep, wonderful discussion. And we had a great discussion. But actually, what we kept doing was meeting other people. And it became something else. The problem for me was making that into, you know, uh, a, a short, well, an audio paper that, that, that fitted the time frame. Uh, and I, I went over that. Um, I actually have enough material to do about I'm going to say podcasts, about nine podcasts, and that's probably what I will do. So the next problem was editing that down, uh, was just, uh, that was probably more painful than the walk because there were so many wonderful experiences. What I discovered along the way um, was, I think, the desperate, the desperate um, joy of people that were emerging from lockdown and rediscovering these walking routes, um, many of which were on the canal, some of them on the landscape. Um, what I discovered was um, a view of the landscape that I grew up in that I, I thought I knew, but I've never seen, um, you know, because I was walking all day, every day, um, and you experience time very differently. You experience pain, obviously, uh, and you experience um, space. So probably to end, I would say that one of the things I didn't expect was to do with my mother. Um, I come from very close to our destination in the Midlands. I'm, I'm from Birmingham originally, and my mother uh, lives in Tamworth. So Litchfield Cathedral, where we walk to, the, the site of this ancient pilgrimage, um, is very near to my mother. It's it's about 15 kilometres most. And I used to live next to the cathedral. I've walked from where I live now, um, but from Chester Cathedral. If I drive to my mother, it takes 65 minutes, maybe 70 minutes. And that's my understanding of that distance, of that uh, time frame, and that's my understanding of that journey. But to walk it took seven days. And that's a very different experience. And it made me realize that we have forgotten a lot, I think, about our experience, uh, possibly of um, duration and landscape and travel and walking. I, I've, I've said enough. There's so m many more things I could have said, but it was a wonderful experience. I'm very thankful um, uh, to have had the opportunity as well to to create this for uh, our conversation. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And uh, as well, um, um, as you have uh, as you have mentioned about walking, uh, the walking encounters and confidence in play space not about being in your comfort zone. It's an event happening at. Uh, about 300 kilometers away from the nearest airport, um, at 60 kilometers away from the nearest uh, public transport. So to get there is is already suffering. So you will, next time we expect you there, <laughs> and Jess will be able to tell you more about uh, suffering to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, but as well, um, the, the whole event is not just about the aesthetical aspect of walking um, as an art form. It's about much more than about the questions and being in a very problematic area, uh, but as well, um, seeing walking as a way of questioning uh, and uh, 
has a potential to transform um, the, the, uh, um, our environment and our world uh, by being uh, subversive. Uh, walking may be one of the last subversive free acts we can uh, actually um, do without consuming anything in any way. And uh, so, um, that's also why we in Prespa, even in this gorgeous natural environment, um, connected with urban areas, places around the world that have their questions, that have their problematics, and uh, that people uh, joined us with their um, um, the, uh, with their stories and with their um, experiences. And uh, one of the uh, the strong, uh, uh, let's say. Um, the, the strong stories we got uh, was from Pavel, in, um, uh, who's from Belarus, and um, uh, in his audio paper. So, Pavel, would you like to tell something more about your work and who you are? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello again to everyone, and thank you for inviting me for this cafe. new and interesting format for me and uh, the audio paper was the first time I used this format so thanks for the conference organizers and the topic that provoked me to um, to pack all uh, what I wanted to say or at least something that I wanted to say about the events in Belarus into this story. Uh, I'm an electronic musician. I make uh, both dance music and non-dance music and make audiovisual um, performances, live performances and installations. And also I, I'm teaching uh, at a university which is uh, from Belarus originally, but for the last 17 years it's in Lithuania in, in a political exile because it was banned in, in Minsk. So, uh, for the last year, uh, since uh, around the presidential elections happened in the last August year, I stopped making my own music because it didn't fit the atmosphere and my mood and event. But I was walking around the city with th thousands and hundreds of thousands of people uh, and I had a recorder and I recorded uh, demonstrations, uh, the wild concerts and all kinds of events that were part of this uh, huge uh, protest movement. Uh, and have an archive if you somehow record it and then to make a story of it. Uh, or to tell something. It appeared quite easy to tell about the events and uh, the role the online meetings like we have now, uh, uh, some conference, but it was extremely difficult for me to write a proper ac academic uh, paper. As uh, it would it would need somehow to integrate uh, the sound the sound examples uh, the clashing of all kinds of sounds during the protests so uh, I was struggling with a couple of proposals uh, to write uh, an article but it kept prowling more and more like turning all almost into a, a draft to a book. But then I saw a uh, uh, call for papers uh, of the uh, working as a question conference and I thought that I at least I can squeeze uh, some through the frame of as a question. Yes. Uh, on paper that uh, uh, just the very simple act of was, uh, for the last year and before for the um, 20, 30 years it always has now uh, much more people understood how dangerous 
can it be when you can walk out of your house and get arrested uh, for nothing and uh, get in jail? So this uh, idea, uh, walking is the right to walk your own city, uh, who has to be heard in that city, who has the right their own. So this gave me the opportunity to tell this story. Uh, I tried to um, in, into 15 minutes, but was impossible. It was 45 at first. Then I kept uh, editing, 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 end up about uh, half an hour. Uh, I, um, a, in, an interesting uh, uh, part of the pro process of working was that uh, I couldn't work uh, with a computer. I couldn't write the script for uh, events uh, for, for the because uh, it kept uh, leading me to not to the right direction. So uh, I started to write on paper, a for format paper, as very simple phrases, uh, cutting and making it simpler and simpler, and then recording, re recording. So uh, it, it was not just uh, the new the new format for me, uh, but also writing, because usually I had no writing with a digital event and uh, the atmosphere in the country and um, everything it, it somehow hindered uh, the regress of working of in book in some some so in in many ways it was very they transformed for me uh, this audio paper. So I, I would be full for any feedback. Listen to it because, especially, much feedback from inside my country. And the reasons are for many emotionally very difficult to to listen to it. Uh, like a couple of friends told me that they, they were crying by the end, or some, some people. Uh, uh, I'm kind of, um, sometimes I'm sending it to some friends, of course, a warning that uh, it can be difficult and then I get nothing back. And, and another thing is that uh, I cannot just openly advert here. Our most popular, popular independent media are now considered extremists, uh, outlets and uh, banned. They are not accessible without VPN. So, like, um, reading it very wide uh, could also uh, draw unnecessary attention because it's uh, quite a dangerous subject. So I, I could talk more, but uh, I'm open to questions. Uh, we'll be grateful for any feedback, as I said. Thank you again. And thank you, Pavel. And, and uh, if you have any questions or feedback for Pavel and for the others, please use the chat, as uh, some of you already have uh, uh, found out to do. Um, another form of subversiveness that is um, embedded in walking uh, was elaborated uh, by the Carters Assembly. Um, we have at least Jessica and, and Rico um, with us uh, tonight uh, to present themselves and uh, their work they made. Please, uh, Jessica and Rico, enlighten us. Hello, everybody. Actually, we have another uh, member of the Assembly, Marco. I joined uh, now. Yeah. Um, so um, we are three of a collective assembly, but actually we are the three also that have uh, edited the audio walk together. 
So, um, like, uh, we present ourselves in some words, and then uh, we just read a little bit of presentation we have pre prepared uh, to explain some of the elements, because also the name Ted the Mole, and then uh, who is Ted, the card the assembly, uh, just uh, to explain. So I'm Jessica, I've studied the literature, now I'm, like, uh, I'm a teacher. And then uh, I make some uh, little uh, intervention in music for uh, writing or um, collaboration with some projects. And uh, with, I've met uh, Enrico and Marco in Florence when I was living there in uh, 2019. And uh, we uh, knew each other uh, for a spontaneous assembly in a place that was uh, redesigned by the major. So the mayor, and uh, so we decide uh, to to create an, assemb an assembly, and uh, we are here, <laughs> and it's super good uh, finally to go out with uh, Ted, and to meet uh, all of you, and uh, Enrico may uh, maybe can continue. Yeah, how then I maybe would just go to. Uh, the reading, I'm Enrico Tomassini, um, I'm a researcher, young researcher, and uh, at the moment I'm working as an artistic curator for a project of cultural cooperation, and I have been always fascinated by the topic of walking, and when Jessica proposed uh, to participate to walk, list and create PRESPA conference, I was really amazed and happy uh, to take part to it, and that's it. <laughs> maybe we just start reading, or maybe Marco wants to say something. Marco, are you here? Hello. Hi, I'm, I'm Marco. Now we can go on with the reading, uh, you two can read the presentation. It's okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I start with the idea of uh, Ted, uh, because uh, was born during several uh, self-run assemblies, as we said, and we were uh, at, that was uh, attended mostly by students or uh, fresh graduates, and uh, from different backgrounds, we uh, all felt the need to uh, discuss and criticize the way the city of Florence, in specific, uh, was changing uh, in the last decade and the way urban spaces, especially public spaces, have been transformed mostly to make them more suitable for the tourist industry. industry. So square and streets have been redesigned, especially to marginalize immigrants, working poor, students, homeless, people who don't have much capital to spend in the center. So, and yeah, we called ourselves Carders Assembly. Uh, the Carders were the emblem of the working poor class in the medieval Florence. Uh, more specifically, the Carders were the working force of the medieval city of Florence, and they used to card the raw, the raw wool to make it softer and cleaner. The Carders were the protagonists of the Chompy Revolt, which is also the name of the square where we started our assemblies in Florence from 1378 to 1382, uh, which was the first European up uprising of the kind. We organized and participated in different events, happenings, happenings and all the process in response to top-down urban changes in its spontaneity was documented by archiving assemblies, reports, self-organized actions, hence composing a collective process of knowledge production. By making mistakes, by learning true new forms of pedagogies that within a forming community of practice, negotiating its meaning and identity. Okay, for us. And who is Ted? Uh, Ted actually is the result of an error, a literal error of composition. Uh, among the events we organized, the 1st November 2019, uh, we organized a funeral uh, of public square in general. So we like perform a little ceremony to transport uh, through the city 
Center a Tombstone to reach and deposit in Piazza dei Ciompi, the, the first, where the first assembly took place, the redesigned place. And the square uh, to resume was for 50 yards a flea market. And then after 15 years of now um, useless participatory survey with the, the inhabitants, uh, one day was redesigned by a friend, uh, architect friend of the mayor. So uh, that now in the center we have uh, uh, enclosed area enclosed by a fence that is closed to 8 p.m. Uh, from 8 p.m. to 8 uh, a.m. and uh, to with the intention of leaving out uh, drug addicts, uh, homeless people, noisy young students and people. Uh, so this way you don't have benches uh, accessible in the evening, you only can sit uh, in the door of the private activities and the side of square, and this is a process that interests this neighborhood, but of course uh, a lot of uh, center neighborhoods, and also disappeared the public toilets and public fountains. So we made this funeral, and uh, when we were uh, laser cutting uh, the letters for uh, the tombstone, um, we had some extra letters cut by error. So this letter created uh, the syntagma uh, Ted de la Talpa, in Italian, Ted de Moll. So we uh, felt uh, like uh, this phrase uh, 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 was calling to us no? to be a resultant uh, surplus excluded from the central discourse. And uh, for us, it was perfect to describe the point of view of the marginalized people. So like we start to make some fantasies about uh, this uh, fictional character Ted de Mol and how how is he and what can he do uh, and so on. And impressively, after some researches, uh, we found out that the Mol is like a symbol uh, for a lot of uh, literature, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Marx, and Lenin, and Hegel. We discovered um, seen uh, the more like uh, the, re the revolutionary forces working uh, underground. Ted has become for us the narrative device and the polyphonic spots no human being uh, to tell what's happening to the center of Florence. So we respected the multifaceted core of this fictional creature by setting up a multi-voiced piece made up of fragments of other people's stories, collective reflections, atmospheres, individual researches, TED speeches, with the special contribution of Florence Mayer. In the same direction, that of the investigation of the multi-nature of TED, we intentionally insert some references to some notion of non-human, the end of nature, hybridation, multi-species aliens, Fragmentation, fragmentation of identities, ruin of capitalism. Discussed in some academic researches as the seminal test Cetoducene by Don Haraway and others to give an example. So that's why we choose to narrate Ted's poly polymorphic tale through this multi audio walk, which can be experienced as a performative tour. The tour is articulated in order to show the absurdity and no sense of masterism, and what sort of impact it has on lives, but also it is conceived to be an act of dissent and making it visible by walking it. This audio walk is the first revelation of TED in public space. And to end uh, this uh, occasion to make, to think about the audio walk, um, was stimulating us to think about uh, uh, interaction in the different directions. So we, uh, of course, so we were thinking about the elements of the audio walk, the authors, the, the listening uh, uh, and the public, and also about a fourth element, uh, which is the territory, not the specific physical place you are. So we uh, wanted like to create a game uh, of differences and uh, similarities uh, uh, between uh, all uh, the possible uh, physical uh, places uh, inside this audio walk. So Florence as for us the, the reference, the contingent uh, reference, or uh, Florence of the imaginative uh, 
multiverse uh, of narrative or uh, uh, Florence uh, disseminated in all our cities, like uh, uh, with some X or dynamics or um, uh, material things, no? So the, the gentrified, privatized city, neoliberalized city, humiliated city uh, in um, the city of the person who will uh, listen the, the audio walk. So we uh, insert some instructions to uh, try to play with this, uh, so to, to ask people to give us a feedback or note down something, pay attention to a specific uh, aspect uh, we were talking about, uh, uh, so like like this was for uh, trying if waiting if something arrives. Uh, we are open to discuss about this. Uh, I present this version also of Florence <laughs> that we try to relate it uh, as experience also, and that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, Enrico, and Marco, for sharing this uh, multiverse um, uh, that, that uh, starts from Florence and goes to the rest of the world. Uh, now, um, uh, thank you all uh, for um, sharing your, um, your ideas and work and, and uh, visions. Um, there is already an, an, another multiverse of questions uh, happening in the chat, uh, but maybe we can go first to um, some people that want to, before we go into the chat, uh, to, maybe you want to ask uh, personally a question to one of the uh, one of the speakers um, or to each other as a speaker. Um, so feel free, um, or if Janis, if you want to comment on something, please. Uh, uh, the floor is open now. The cafe is now all yours. Come on. Viv has put a, a question um, about folded time in the chat, and I think it would be good to maybe answer that verbally rather than to try and, <laughs> and, and write it. Um, I, I, well, I mean, Jeremy asked a question, and Jeremy, you might have a better answer than me. Um, Viv, my, my answer is um, basic because it's not a, a, a specialism of mine. I did read about it some time ago, but my answer would be about folded time, that it comes from the idea that there are different forms of time. Now, if I remember rightly, one is the, the kind of human concept of time as in a watch or a clock. So this idea of time that is, is measured in this way and therefore could be reversed or, you know, um, I, I remember that then the natural kind of order of things is entropy. So you have this idea of time that slowly degrades. So I suppose on a walk, I slowly degrade, um, you know, in terms of the, what, what the, the impact of time on the, the ground, on the body, things like that. And thirdly, um, I think uh, there's the idea of the way that we use technology to um, to uh, what's the word to document time and therefore freeze it in some way, but the simple answer for me, creatively, artistically, is that there's then this idea of using our creativity, and this is why I think it's been talked about in creative writing, using our creativity to fold time, to reverse it, to change it, to rearrange it, and that as a concept is just really playful. Um, have I got that right, Jeremy? I think that's... Um... Yeah, I, um, yeah p p pretty bob on there, Simon. Um, I would add uh, in, um, that one of the things that Sarah talks about in a um, really interesting book, he wrote uh, Variations on the Body, which is in French. I think you can get, a, I think you can get a, an English translation. Um, and he talks, he, he describes it in the way that it, it's, it's like, making bread so the time that it takes first of all for the seed to grow and then for the farmer to harvest it and then for the grain to be processed and then it comes as flour and then the baker starts working at it so when we as final consumer eat the bread there is all that time already um involved in that loaf so I'm sort of thinking that, you know, the, the folded time from, from a walking perspective isn't just 
the actual moment of walking it's the before and the process and the thinking about it and the planning you know it doesn't just suddenly happen mm -hmm. thank you thanks very much yeah that's that's a great concept <laughs> I think I think it, it, it it's a, I mean I've only come across it quite recently in that way, and I think it sort of describes quite a lot of the way that a lot of us work really. You know, because otherwise we just might as well just walk down to the shops, <laughs> which is different. Yeah, also valid. But... <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. I've thought of an application of that in terms of fine art. It was somebody, as a, uh, when as an art student, somebody said, um, you know, you just spend 30 seconds on doing this. And the tutor said, well, you don't know how long he prepared to do that 30 seconds. So um, there's no way it could have been five years. So the mark itself is you know, it, it, well, that's all, that's it. <laughs> it's that's the same lovely. sort of idea, isn't it, really, in a way? Yeah, uh, Robert, it's that sort of thing, oh, my five-year-old could have done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, 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 and Picasso would have answered, if only. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if only I, I you know, the other way around kind of inverted it, yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the, the let's say the the element of of time in the sound walking or in let's say in, in, in locative walking is is more and more becoming an, um, a part of the artistic uh, universe. Um, uh, I um, remember uh, more and more artists are seeing are seeing time as as an other form of space and uh, are, are exploring the potential of um, locative media as a way to uh, to create an alternative time, not only an alternative reality or an augmented reality, but also an augmented, uh, augmented time in which you can walk as much as you can walk into uh, the so-called uh, physical space. Um, I remember some work of uh, Nigel uh, Bristol that he presented as well on the Balkans in Cafe some time ago, where he, uh, um, if I, he wanted to invite people to walk uh, in the room listening to the sounds that were recorded uh, 20 years before in the same room and um, uh, claiming that this is the closest you can get to to time travel or to travel to the past in that sense uh, because uh, space is not only made out of its um, uh, three dimensions but as well as what it's uh, the timely experience uh, what the, the so um, in, in in physics um, as others may let's say no better to explain than me uh, time is seen not as something consecutive, uh, but um, uh, as uh, like a book with uh, hundreds of pages, but which are all torn out and put um, on the surface, uh, on, on, on the floor. So every event is a page, but every event is actually happening both at the same time as consecutively, separately on the page. So, um, and so you can actually walk in time. Um, and this, um, um, you see this in, 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 in more and more um, experimental works in uh, audio walking uh, happening, this interest. Well, I guess I've always had that feeling with my own work, <laughs> that I'm walking other people's traces from a different time as well as the walk I'm actually doing in the real time. So yeah, that's a, that's a resonant idea. Yeah, and somehow I have really the feeling that the dimension of time is a very underrated dimension compared to the others, and that art tries to expand on that dimension also because of the need of, you know, suspending, you know, we perceive time in our daily lives such as an accelerated dimension, and through audio, also working on the piece and also listening to others' audio pieces, I really have the impression that I can perceive time differently, even just when I listen to a song or I listen, you know, or I'm watching a movie in which there is like a pause or, you know, 
it expands my, the dimension of time and in my daily life I'm not really used to it with the rhythms of that I have in my daily life somehow I and instead is so underrated and it's so important to give it value somehow Yes, the going now. So related with your work, I think that um, audio walking, as it started, let's say, let's roughly say 20, 20 years ago, um, their first interest was to go beyond the line linearity, or um, uh, in the psychographic sense of, of creating mm -hmm. the rifts, rifts um, giving people the chance to, on an intuitive way, uh, to approach an, a place, uh, not going from point A to B to C, but um, giving them both agency as the possibility to be surprised uh, by multiple dimensions of a place um, and um, so um, I think the interest in time is, is, is following on that because uh, um, as time is more and more seen as non-linear uh, but um, so it gives the possibility to get lost uh, to, to uh, mutate the space uh, by bringing in time as an, as an extra dimension you can travel and inter interact with in your uh, audio work. Um, Can I make another point? I've thought of another thought. Um, yeah. I'm tending to think in terms of hallucinations right now. And there's, in consciousness theory, it talks in terms of uh, controlled hallucinations. Now, uh, if you can see our aspect or our reception of time as an hallucination, is, as that's the way the brain works, um, i.e. as part of being, in a sense, and um, this uh, metaphor you used of a book with the leaves th thrown on the floor, with each page reading as it is, but coexisting in time or as time, that you could see uh, controlled hallucinations in the same way. So if you think of hallucinations as being somebody we would relate, someone who would need, need medical treatment, but controlled hallucinations as a natural way to deal with the fact that we see in terms of hallucinations. So everything is a hallucination, time, everything we experience. And in those sort of terms, rather than in terms of a theory of something out there, which we can't see anyhow, because we're bound by the limitations. I don't know if it's our brain or our cells or whatever it is, that these are all, I, I can't take that thought much further, but it's just, it shows a different way if you like, you can see in that sense, time is a conceit. It's just another word, basically. If you see, if you see life in terms of hallucinations, how does that relate to time? <laughs> I don't quite know how it does, but. Um... Anyway, it is uh, giving a place to the subjective and to yeah. not to the sort of objective, uh, trying to grasp things, but to let go and to um, to render yourself uh, to uh, to an experience, uh, which is actually where is as well audio walking is about. Uh, it's not about yeah. trying to uh, to get people to a certain point in a certain time, but uh, to um, get them give them an experience in which they cannot predict in advance what will happen. Um, and um, as well as an artist, not try to predict what will happen, uh, but to leave things open, the uh, possibilities uh, unfold. And maybe that uh, brings and me... labels, not yeah. giving things labels, just letting whatever it is. I don't know what. <laughs> yes, maybe we can go to uh, Simon. You wanted to say something? Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know how to put my hand down now, though. Has my hand gone down? <laughs> Uh, Sorry, I'm talking. Well, just, I, I was listening to. I, I made me think as well that the the other side of that is, you know, Enrico, you mentioned with um, both of you with your project, the idea of the not the idea but the working classes with the history of I, now, by carding, uh, I I think we use the same word. It's a textile word for teasing the the wool. Is that right, the carding? Mm -hmm. And this, of course, um, makes me think of time and industry and the fact that, you know, this isn't just about the, the philosophy or the leisure of, of, of walking or, or it's about repetition. And for me, interested in the, I suppose, the suffering of that. In many respects, working in repetition in those kind of industries is both painful, but also the repetition itself. Do we think that that um, that in a way, how, what am I saying? 
but that also compresses time. When I was younger and I did some factory work, I remember that, you know, there's that idea that the busier that you are, the, the faster the time goes, you know, but I was just taken about, I don't really have a question, but I'm interested in that kind of, in that working class experience, I suppose, that the kind of the, the reality of that. Not really a question, just a point for discussion. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm. No, it does. I mean, I think, I think it also puts into account the fact of the different perception of time, depending also on the lived experience, uh, you know, in the working modes you have and everything you do. And of course, you know, working people in parts of the world still have to walk very far every day as well, either to and from work or, you know. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of Teasel's. <laughs> so uh, I've been in Scotland recently and uh, there's a lot of Teasel's in Scotland, but it's maybe in Europe it was the same, but it's a very uh, spiky plant that I think in uh, many years ago was used for carding or it was it was um, used in the process of carding. So something which you would have to go and find, you know, by walking and then um, and then uh, I think attach to an object like a, a, a square of wood or something in order to, you know, to do that process, which is just again, it's not a question. It's just a response to your wonderful um, to your wonderful discussion. <laughs> yeah. There was something I, about, I have a question. Back to this concept of time. Uh, it came to me, which is in a way which is obvious, but has occurred after what uh, Enrico has said, that uh, visual arts uh, had as a main goal to, to freeze time until at least uh, late early 20th century and uh, so it uh, for, for 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 millennia one could say the the concept is how you freeze time how you create uh, from uh, you know some like a moment of that uh, by itself and then close time so what happens after uh, after cubism actually i think if i can put it like that and that keeps going on and uh, it is how you expand time and i think that working art comes to that uh, is a tool of expanding the time of how we perceive uh, uh, the artwork within uh, outside the specific not only spatial but also time framework so it's uh, it's a relatively very new uh, how to say evolution almost expected because also the artwork was uh, the objectified again after this uh, the previous and this century so it seems that but by what we are doing as a group as a uh, in that exchange of dialogues we are trying to to go beyond uh, and create a new aspect of time so to say and watching and uh, all the audio pieces and all the, these uh, working uh, expressive tools are uh, adding to this direction. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I'm going to change, uh, deviate a little bit from time, but I do have a question that I'm super curious about. And I started thinking about it with Maria Ristani, um, but it's pretty much for everyone. I, you know, a lot of people seem to talk about how this was a new and novel way to explore and express your ideas um, to present them. And I'm just curious sort of what you saw, how that how that came out, came out in the reception of the ideas. Like, did it change the audience? Did it change how they they received it? Did you feel a different relationship with with the audience, perhaps, or with the reception of the work? I'm just curious about that side of it, sort of having finished it, how was it different from a you know an academic paper after that point? Um, I think I think the reception, if 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 I can jump in and uh, be the first to answer that, uh, I think the reception is certainly much more experiential, um, in a sense. It's it, if that makes sense that 
um, listening to something to all those um, to all these critical discussion and walking at the same time instead of simply reading a text and visually interpreting a text sort of creates a much more enriched experience for the audience and it implicates the body as I've I've tried to say in a much um, deeper sense. Uh, so you get to appreciate something not only intellectually, not only through your mind, but you also get to experience what's been described um, through through your body. So I think it's sort of for the audience, it's perhaps an augmented experience away from from mere intellectual appreciation. I don't know if I'm answering um, your question with me. Okay. Certainly. But I also like to, uh, I really like this point of view of Maria, but Ristani, but I also have the feeling in terms of also, you know, audience reception of it, mm -hmm. that somehow some people, often people are very used to other media um many people they the, you know and not people from the art scene specifically but more uh, the proper audience of uh, an art piece that people that do not work with art um and some are more keen to you know to to make this experience but some are not really that the feedback i also received on this kind of like work it's also that um you know uh, is, it is also why you haven't done something audio, audio visual. Um, audio visual. Yeah, that actually happened also with our work. Now there, there is an artist that has been interested in our work and proposed us a uh, cinematography treatment for it. Um, and the, the point of it, it was mainly because it reaches more people. And our work, being you know an activistic work, of course mm -hmm. it wants to reach people. Um, and this is the thing, like if you really want to reach the people um, in a broader sense, like the so-called general public, um, then uh, audio is still like a stingy uh, medium mm. uh, for many. Uh, and this is um, just a point, just a reflection I'm sharing, I don't... Yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think it takes time, doesn't it? It takes time and a lot of unlearning sensory unlearning um, for people to appreciate audio. But I think it's happening. I think we are sort of nearly there. But I get your point on, especially on activist um, interventions that you need to reach the wider public and perhaps yeah. audio is not always the best way to do that. I get your point. Uh, Pavel, I would be uh, very specifically interested in, in your point of view on this, um, how, because your work has a very activist element as well. Um, and, um, um, the, the, how do you the, saw the, let's say, the interaction with the public, with the audience uh, in this world, in this sense, uh, in, uh, this uh, better world, um, in your work? Mm -hmm. it, it is a very difficult question because um, I think that um, this particular, I would mostly uh, be recepted by the foreign audience, uh, it's in English, and the second and that it uh, refers to the events that are already passed. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it encompasses a period uh, till the last December or till the beginning of this year. And uh, the, the is changing so fast. Uh, are like become almost irrelevant this very after a couple of they said that it was very important to somehow integrate 
uh, the experience emotionally on the emotional level because uh, there was so much happening that you just don't have time to process it mentally or you process it on some uh, uh, level but, but this true experience with some of them they are not um, uh, they don't have a catharsis or some something else like it, it evokes a lot of emotion uh, this kind of audio work and I was said that um, uh, it, it touches you deep or photo because we are mostly used to um, consume the news or to get the news through text uh, through videos now but um, uh, the picture distracts a lot and uh, uh, for many people it was very novel um, relief uh, to re-experience uh, those events and somehow to have some emotional release maybe after some dramatic events but of course the reception inside my country and outside a lot uh, 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 it depends on whether the people were present here during these events to how how these sounds how these um, noises how they resonate with you uh, this particular space and also to come back to the pre time i wanted to add that uh, for example my work it's not uh, i will all their work in a literal sense in in the sense that uh, you cannot uh, put headphone walk from uh, point a to point b uh, while listening to it because it mixes uh, audio recordings from different ends well, over four or five months and uh, and various uh, locations so it's kind of it, you you cannot uh, just take a map and uh, trace uh, the city uh, listening to it but uh, being in some of these places actually remember what was happening then so it's kind of a multi-layered map uh, in terms of space and in terms of time and in terms of topics as well Pavel I wanted to ask you as well something because I was listening to your um... I listened to your to your audio uh, audio work, your audio paper, and at some point you mentioned that during the uh, the demonstrations they were uh, they were broadcasting this music publicly on the streets of uh, Belarus, and I was very curious to know more about that because, um, yeah, I mean it's 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 very tragic, but also it's it you you presented it in a kind of comical. Um, way that it it was yeah you can tell us maybe a little bit more about that yeah thank you maria for the question yes it was sometimes uh, very uh, the state in many issues in terms of culture and aesthetics um they're very, very backward and awkward also and uh, when they don't know how to cope with the situation they use the like a very old box like our state uh, considers uh, i mean the official part uh, the president uh, the so-called president and the top uh, officials they can uh, the soviet union mm -hmm. so all this uh on a Mm, uh, war victory the second war, world war the great patriotic war uh, these aesthetics uh, this music uh, this culture it uh, permits uh, like in intersperses everything and when they don't know what to do how to cope with uh, masses of people on the streets on some music and of course the very first choice for them 
is to, to claim this space to mark the territory with uh, these uh, cultural um, signifiers, with this old Soviet music. Uh, it is used uh, to change the mood of people to somehow, uh, the, um, I think they uh, hope that people would be discouraged, especially they air the, they broadcast this kind of music around certain sacred uh, places like uh, war museum or monuments. So it's, it's a very symbolic thing that they kind of uh, make this uh, space time capsules or um, like the it literally sounds like as if uh, the time and, and was from 1940s or 50s from the Stalin era. It's it's a very absurd. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe they think that they, they are scaring uh, the protesters, but uh, it, it's quite funny. And people actually asked uh, the city government, uh, the uh, why did they uh, broadcast it uh, this uh, military kind of songs? Example. And they said, oh, we did it to uh, create atmosphere uh, who are not, not into the protests, something like that. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's, it's very Ill illogical sometimes. And I also, you asked about uh, the process of recording, how I was recording it. Uh, yes. I was just using uh, a uh, recorded this one uh, then uh, you are part of a very la large crowd like a hundred thousand people it is easy to get lost draw, draw L, uh, from the but uh, there were a couple of times when I just got uh, detained. They were looking for people who are photographing what's happening, who are capturing, and uh, they were very close. But uh, it's it's not the biggest problem uh, to record. It's one thing, but uh, too securely, because uh, it's a very sensitive material. Even if you avoid people uh, who are uh, going to a pro who you know. Um, anyway, some talks, uh, some communication gets recorded uh, it to be to get into the wrong a lot about how to archive all, all this securely. Uh, then to edit uh, that uh, no one would be identifiable. Because even though uh, were peaceful and, in fact, allowed uh, according to our legislation, it doesn't mean get uh, arrested for e even things that are allowed according to constitution legislation. They have answered to. Uh, this yes. couple of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are cutting a little bit, so we, um, I was trying to understand um, what you were saying uh, sometimes. But yeah, I think I got I got the, mm. the bigger picture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel and Maria. Uh, Jess, you had some questions for both Marias. Uh, uh, I don't know if they are uh, answered by now, but uh, if you now is your chance yeah. to yeah, to um, ask. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Pavel, I, I, I mean, my questions are just so um, unimportant compared to your experience, and thank you so much for sharing it. Um, it reminds me a bit of being in um, East Berlin in the 80s, and then when the wall came down, but a very different time zone and different experience. So thank you very much for sharing. You're an amazing person. Um, on a lighter note, for the many years, <laughs> um, I'm really interested in what you were doing. Um, I don't know much about this audio ideas apart from uh, not not directly into the ear, but you know through through performance itself. So, but you know th this question of um, the action of the listener walker 
as an individual, um, if, if they're listening to somebody else speaking or, or whatever it is, like you're doing Enrico, um, does it then become a personal performance or is it a private performance between self and the outer voice? Um, Maria, shall I start with you like to pick up? Yes, go ahead, please. Yes. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Now that that's a very that's a very big discussion, especially in um, <laughs> theater studies. Yeah. Um, especially in theater studies, since we associate theater with a collective communal experience. Um, people um, sharing the same story in the same space. What happens with um, those headphone uh, theatre walks? <laughs> and it's certainly a much more individualized and privatized experience because you get this voice speaking directly, um, directly in your ear. And especially with earphones, this is this is a very strong experience. So it feels like it's an in your head theater, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But of course, private does not mean immune or oblivious to surroundings, because there have been um, theater walk experiments that instead of taking the spectator off space in a bubble, head bubble-like experience, they sort of um, return those spectators back to their surroundings in a much more enhanced way by sharing stories about the places that those spectators walk uh, through. Um, stories that often clash with what the spectators witness in space. Um, they sort of transfer them back in the public space and sometimes in a more enhanced way. Does this make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I was more interested in, in this, this, this idea of um, the, the, the wrong word is private, but, you know, this personal performance oh, and being goodness. in a public space and mm. then this third this third piece coming in the third um activator being the voice or the music or whatever it is that you're hearing so it's not just i was just interested in seeing how you sort of felt about it is it it's it's a three-way thing it's not just a two-way thing would you agree that's true it's, that's true it's a three-way thing i agree with okay. that okay okay so then going back going to um M Maria Sideri, Sideri, she's not here now. No. Sideri, yes, that's correct. Oh, hi, hi, you moved on my screen. Hello. So, so when you're doing this, you were talking about your your experience of your personal history, and then trying to explain it to a larger audience in a different way. How did that yes. then come back? How did that then come back at you? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing that for me it was an exercising, exercising actually my memory. It was really okay. as an exercise of like performing memory by using like um, this, uh, let's say this uh, this tool of uh, a visual walk. Yeah. So uh, I I imagine that I enter into this um, uh, imaginary uh, building, and in this building there are these uh, imaginary objects. And uh, in each part of each room, you place uh, this object, and then the object is connected with uh, the story. So that's not me that I have invented that. It's the mnemotechnic. So it's the way that the orators used to um, and still do. I mean, a lot of uh, actors and people that need to remember large amount of texts. That's the way they 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 work it. Um, but the, I think for me it went towards not a personal necessary, um, not a private performance, because I also had the experience of the, of the conference. So that was um, a very different setup. And also I felt like I really wanted to make it accessible for people, because I'm also 
uh, very easily, um, how to say, uh, I disengage very easily as well from um, ultra academic approaches when there is no when there's no uh, body inside involved or when there's um, so um, I try I, I mean I think it's a it's a work that keeps evolving and depending on the setup you can address it to someone specifically or you can address it to a larger group uh, or you and and that's I think that's what's great with sound in general that it gives you that possibility because it's non-material so it's an immaterial thing that you can with very small amendments you can you can just change it and shift it the way you you want but in generally I think there is there is a choreography into things and there is a way to uh, capture your audience and also uh, engage with your audience whether this is recorded or whether this is uh, simply th theory whether this is uh, uh, something more personal more political um, I think that there is there is this um, this thing this choreographer says that I like very much that your you have one minute to captivate your audience uh, mm -hmm. the first minute is very decisive because uh, and I think there's there's all sorts of ways that you can do that with uh, with sound as well as well with movement or with um, with uh, a performance and activism in public spaces or uh, with a very strong political piece that is also an audio piece like Pavel presented or uh, with a pilgrimage or I think um, yeah I think it's it's a great medium. <clears throat> Thank you. Time is indeed something very, let's say, <laughs> shaped by the circumstances and by the uh, uh, by the beauty of of, uh, of ideas and visions as they are unfolded uh, now. Uh, we are uh, now almost uh, more than more than a half hour uh, together, and it looked like this one fascinating, inspiring minute where Maria was uh, talking about. So if somebody would have a last question, a last feedback, a last comment to anybody uh, or to everybody at the same time, um, please go for it. Um, I wanted to, to add something about uh, uh, the discussion uh, about the methodology in academic uh, research and uh, academic also restitution of uh, the results of research. No? Because uh, uh, when I've met uh, this uh, community, virtual community uh, online uh, of audio walk and reflecting about this, um, I was super grateful that a lot of people are working in academic are in, <laughs> because uh, it seemed to me like something super uh, avant, avant garde uh, to, to make uh, this type of reflection. Uh, when uh, you arrive from some uh, backgrounds, uh, uh, really traditional uh, backgrounds, and then uh, um, I lived one year in Uruguay, so I discovered, for instance, all the work of the extension, the extension in South America. So in the field of academic research in South America, they have like this other uh, column of work, like uh, uh, didactic uh, research and ex extension. So like in, I don't know if uh, someone uh, know, no, the, the part of the institution of the university out uh, America, but it's like uh, a part of uh, including uh, the public. So by organizing a, a workshop uh, uh, for the population, for everyone who wants to, uh, to participate and so on. And I've, I've met a lot of professor researching in an active way, like teaching, giving uh, workshops uh, and uh, giving some uh, occasion like this uh, to uh, reflect about something in the spaces, uh, the public spaces of university and outside. But um, I think that uh, if we understand that these, uh, like Maria Ristani was saying at the beginning, no? like uh, if this audio work form uh, is suitable or also um, profitable for their academic research, uh, in, we can imagine a lot of other forms, so we can 
I finally arrived to discuss uh, about uh, emotion and other things uh, uh, together, like forms, uh, structures, and emotions and artistic people in the same discussions and not to uh, say, I think this is a very, very good door for uh, uh, real uh, serious uh, uh, theoretical results and discussions, no? Uh, but also very, um, like, enjoyable way, no? It's not the vulgariza vulgarization, not in a negative way of the podcast that is more like uh, uh, diffusion of something or finding information, but this is a uh, continuous uh, recreating uh, research and art uh, uh, reflection together. So I'm uh, so happy about uh, all uh, we are discussing. Uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. It's indeed very relevant uh, about what we are doing and we are trying to do. This horizontality and constant interaction. Maybe, Janis, you want to have a last word on this? Um, no, no, I was, you know, we are concluding a process that has started for uh, over uh, five months ago, four months ago already. We are already working a lot, and for those who are present and have been present, Please start sending us photos from uh, uh, and videos from the for our archive. We are now entering the second, the third phase of the 2021, which is the creation of the archive and the documentation via publication on the films. So, thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>